talk to you today still on intimacy with Jesus. Continuing from where we started from last week. You remember that last week I was talking about the urgency of the moment when it comes to being intimate with the Lord. We distincted the difference between urgency and emergency. We understood that emergency has to do with panic situations, imminent tragedy, but urgency doesn't mean so. Agency has to do with making a market of opportunity because it may go and never come back again. Yesterday, I was having a very interesting discourse with Pastor David. And I asked him a very simple question. I said, Pastor David, do you know that when Apostle M.K. Intumi was a chairman of the Church of Pentecost, he was your age, we started talking. We had an interesting conversation. So we are not small boys like that. The whole church of Pentecost, the chairman was like us. And you are still referring to us as future leaders. Where is the future? (laughs) The future is here. There is no future leaders anywhere. And if at this age, we don't think grown and still looking for somebody to guide our path and not understand the season that we are in, we'll be shocked. Time will fly away like a bird. And especially if it is not a bird zone, we are gone. I'm not going back to what we have done. I'm going forward. Today I'm talking to you still about intimacy with Jesus. Awake, oh sleeping bride, awake. Awake, sleeping bride, awake. Song of Songs 5, the verse 3 said, I sleep, but my heart wicked. I'm asleep. But my heart, wicked, it is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat, how shall I put it on? I have washed my feet, how shall I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. And my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved. And my hands dropped with myrrh. And my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh. Upon the handles of the lock. (laughs) I opened to my beloved. But my beloved hath withdrawn himself. My beloved hath withdrawn himself. And was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Friend, time and tide waits for no man. I remember when I was growing up, it was a common addict my mother would always tell us. Time and tide waited for no man. She was prompt with her time, believed everything had to be done 
in time and not out of time. Try as she may, we will still be late. <laughs> oh, you didn't hear that one. What am I saying? Opportunities come our way. And usually, for whatever the reason is, we come up with all manner of excuses in responding aright in the gates of opportunity. The Bible says redeeming the time. The Greek word used is agorazo. Which actually means make a market of opportunity when it comes to time. In my little economics class in my MBA, I remember one time my lecturer walked in and was teaching us the principle of demand and supply. And he said something. That opportunity lost is actually opportunity cost. And we had to discuss that for a whole lesson. When you lose opportunity, remember, it is a cost that you have lost. If you think that opportunity is a loss by way of terminology, Oh, no, it is a cost because in business we are racing against time and turnover. We are not thinking that if there is a product to be sold, whoever will buy it will buy it. No, we want the product to be bought in time so that we can get another product to replace it and turn it over and turn it over and turn it over. So when you lose opportunity, you have lost cost. It will cost you when you lose opportunity. This is the reason why the only thing God gave us was time. So the psalmist said, Teach us to number our days that we may apply our heart to wisdom. Outside of the premise of wisdom, you will think that as you wake and you sleep, seeing the sun and the moon in a 24-hour cycle, life will play out the same every day. But you're deceiving yourself. There was a day you were just being attended to as a baby. And a time came. You had to be responsible for yourself. And not look up to anybody to supply. Or to meet you with aid or help. Teach us to number our days. Your days are numbered. <laughs> it was the adage our teachers would always refer us to. When we are getting close to exams, your days are numbered. Actually, when you entered the school, that moment, your days were numbered. But then, agency of what is ahead woke you up to the demand and the reality of that moment, of that time. Make, redeem the time. Make a market of opportunity. Because the days are evil. My friend, there are no good days anywhere. The moment you have a mindset, oh, you may call it superstition. You may call it paranoid. It is better to be paranoid, to take the right actions, than to sit aloof for opportunity to just pass by. Friend, we are not in good days. We are not in normal days. We are in days that are evil. The demand of the evil day, he said, that you should stand, having done all to stand. There is one thing you will have to understand as I speak to you concerning the sleeping bride. There is a demand to be able to withstand and to stand. He said, put on the whole armor of God 
He said, take up the whole armor of God. They are not the same. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. When you take unto you the whole armor of God, it is important that you know that the moment you take that position, resistance will come your way, demanding your ability to withstand it. If you think that the days are like every other day, opportunities will pass you by. We are in evil days. What makes a day evil? It may sound controversial to some people, but it's okay. When you read the book of Psalms, do you know that the wicked one is referred to as the sword of God? I want you to turn with me and look here. Psalm 17, the verse 13 to the verse 15. Scripture shows expressly that the wicked, he is the sword of God. These are things I've been trying to speak on for some time. Where many people think that the Satan is a loggerheads with God. But for your information, he is God's sword. Psalm 17, the verse 13, can you read for me? Arise, O Lord. Arise, O Lord. Disappoint him. Disappoint him. Cast him down. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked. Deliver my soul from the wicked. Which is thy sword. Which is thy sword. Listen. God is in charge of everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Nothing happens to you outside of God's permission and his granting. Hear what God told Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? He said, ah, Job, skin for skin. Though there is a man, there is no man like him, upright and that he feared God. Hear what Satan told God. He said, stretch your hand and touch all that he has. And let us see what will become of him. Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will cast thee to thy face. Now look at the response. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in your power. Listen to this. Satan tells God, Stretch your hand. Touch all that he has. What is that hand? The wicked one, Satan, he is the hand of God. Look at verse 11 and look at verse 12. Put forth your hand, Satan is telling God, and touch all that he hath. He will curse you to your face. Verse 12, and the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in your power. Then God places a limit. Only upon himself put forth, put not forth thine hand. Oh, I thought that it was supposed to be Satan adjuring God to put his hand on Job. And now God says, it's in your power. Do whatever. But only don't touch himself. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. If that is not enough for you, look at Psalm 17 verse 14 and verse 15. And let's conclude that we are in. The evil day. From men. From men. Are thy hand. Hold on. Hold on. Listen. The wicked is the sword of the Lord. Men are the hand of God. You remember a few mornings ago I was showing to you. That the Bible says you are God's hand. You. You are God's hand. He said refrain not. From touching the lives of people. Why? You are the hand of God. The message Bible. You, you are God's hand. So we have the two hands of God. The hand that reaches out. 
to show kindness and the hand that reaches out to plague and to destroy. All is in God's hands. Number one, the wicked is the sword of the Lord. Number two, from men which are your hand, O Lord, from men of the world which have their portion in this life, whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure, they are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babies. Verse 15 beats the mind. Read for me. As for me, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I will behold your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied mm. when I awake with thy likeness. As for me. I will be satisfied when I'm awakened with your likeness. Who is the hand of the Lord? The world. Let's read verse 14 again. Take it again. From men, which are thy hand? Oh Lord. From men of the world. Hold on. So, who is the hand of God? Men. Men where? Of the world. The world out there. Is the hand of God. Now, then you in here, in the body of Christ, you are also the hand of God. How? To show kindness in the book of Proverbs, to show goodwill, you are also the hand of the Lord. So there are two hands of God. Still, please, if you are one of the doctrine of the good God concept, then you have problems with me. But you can choose to be the good God concept believer. But for me, has there been an evil performed in any day in the book of Amos, he says, that God didn't do it. Every good and every evil comes from God. How? By one of his hands. Either the hand that stretches out Proverbs 3, the verse 27, the message Bible, read for me. Never walk away from someone who deserves help. If somebody deserves help, your hand, never walk away from that person. Your hand is what? God's hand for that person. Your hand is God's hand for that person. So, for your information, there is, if you can take it, that good hand of God, you, not the world. That blessed hand of God, you, not the world. And there is that other hand which comes from the wicked one. It is also the hand of God. The men of the world, they are also the hand of God. Somebody says, who is Pharaoh? For your information, it is God that hardened the heart of Pharaoh. By which hand? The evil hand. Oh, you see, God does not allow Satan into his space when he wants to show you kindness. But if you have to be drilled, then you must know, hear this, when you read the book of Ephesians, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Oh, that is toward the good things. Then he now turns again, he says, Take up the whole armor of God. There is what you put on in the armor. And there is what you take up in the armor. Let me explain it this way. Ephesians 6, the verse 11. Can you read for me? Put on the whole armor of put God. Put on the whole armor of God. That he may be able to stand. That you may be able to stand against people. The tricks of the devil. Oh, when I hear faith preachers. Make it look like it's all about his wiles. <laughs> the devil is just full of tricks. Oh, he's just full of tricks. The devil is not only full of tricks, friend. I'm not magnifying his office. With his wiles, with his deception, you need to put on the whole armor of God. There are times the devil doesn't use tricks. He comes at you. It is not a mirage. It is not an illusion. Listen, when he fires cancer at you, it is not a trick. You don't get it, right? When the devil comes to deceive, he's not touching you. He's appealing to your mind. He's speaking to your conscience. He's buying your thoughts. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. 
that what? You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But now he turns again and says, take up the whole armor of God. Take unto you the whole armor of God. In the verse 13, verse 11, put on. Verse 13, take up. Do you know why? Because in the military, there is a putting on of the accoutrements, the investments of a warrior. Of course, it has to do with your dress and your badge. You put it on. And you expect that everybody who is sane in their minds would respect the uniform. That you are there under the power of attorney representing the entire military force. So everybody should give you respect and honor. You are just supposed to stand. Why? You have put on the military armor. However, there will come a day. Nobody will give regard to your armory by way of the uniform. You need to take up a gun. You need to have swords. You need to take up instruments for your warfare. Not a uniform. In that day, people don't respect you for all your... You can even be a captain. You can even be a commander. Hear this. The moment he says, take up the whole armor of God, he says, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to still keep yourself standing. When you take up the armor of God, you are not doing Christ is my heritage. <laughs> oh, mercy. My identity in Christ. Your identity in Christ is what you put on. Devil, you are a liar. You are not going to touch my child. You are not going to touch my wife. Jesus. You are not going to touch my mother. Eternal you are not going to have this house Christ. to yourself. Jesus. When you go on the offensive, people, you are not putting on the armor. You have taken up the armor. We put on the armor to be on the defensive so that we can stand. We take up the armor so that we can be on the offensive and show the devil where pain should really lie. Jesus. Whatever it is that you are hearing this morning, the tactics of engaging the enemy, the rules of engagement are not the same. So when you hear a preacher that tells you you don't know who you are in Christ, that is how come you are suffering malaria, you don't know your rights in Christ, that he's talking about uniform, uniform, uniform. But in war, who cares who is commander? When there is no war, everybody is aligned. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. At the war front, do we care who is ahead and who is behind? The rules of engagement at the war front is different. At that place, we are withstanding. We are not just standing to salute. We are in the face of the offense. Friend, what then is the evil day? The evil day is not what appeals to your mind. Mm. The evil day is not the day where we engage thoughts. The evil day is that day we engage muscles, we engage all accoutrements, all weapons for war. Jesus. We are not on the defensive. We are on the offensive. Mm. It's an evil day. So, let me just share this with you. Just this week, I was going through Facebook and I laughed at a comment. I, I just couldn't stop myself from laughing. I saw some military men. They were sitting on seesaw. And you know what? Nowadays, Pastor David taught me, whatever you see on Facebook, it is not what you are seeing. The fun part is the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> All you see is it's not about what you see. The fun is the comment session. The last time, let me just say this in passing. Somebody picked up my videos, and I couldn't help myself. I loved, I loved. I was talking about, I think the spirit realm on Susumusem. And I went to the question. 
um, comment session. The first thing I, <laughs> I saw was Seattle. <laughs> Seattle. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> this is somebody who cannot even look at you eyeball to eyeball. Maybe you say Quasiato. <laughs> I just said, I said, ah, Quasiato. <laughs> really? The fun is in the comment section. As for social media, there is no age there. So if you say you're a man of God, forget about your age. A small boy with two CDs <laughs> will buy data and dress you. Somebody who has never bought cement before, he will give you a piece of his mind. Quasiato. <laughs> As for social media, don't come and play there. People have no respect for age and maturity when it comes no. to social media. No. So now watch this. So these military men, they are just jumping, jumping. I went to the conversation. There's somebody there. And these are people going to defend us. <laughs> There's somebody there. <laughs> ah. No respect to. <laughs> Now I'm asking myself the question. When you meet military men in their mess, don't mistake it that they cannot be on the offensive. You will see them in parade saluting officers. They have put on the armory. Should there be war that breaks out, Nobody goes into a war being a military man wearing green and say, I have come. Respect the uniform. Respect which uniform? That is the problem, please let me put it as it is, of the faith movement. They think you go to the war front in uniform. You don't fight in uniform. Friend, take bazooka. Mm. Take cutlass. Mm. Take sword. Yes. Get something in your hand. And stop saying, I know who I am. I know who I am. Your who you are is in the dress. I will teach you a lesson. It's in the weapon. Devil knows your uniform. Where are your weapons? He knows your uniform. Where are your weapons? Faith is good. You are talking about your rank. You are talking about the realm of your authority. When there is no war and there is nothing at stake. But your rank and authority will not be re respected nor regarded when there is a breakout of war. Even a child will not give you the honest. Would he even think that you are, you are what? You are the commander and so what? If that was the case, then Satan didn't need to engage Jesus when he was here on earth. First of all, to begin with, in his 40 day of fasting. Because he has to respect the rank. But do you know what the devil does? He came and said to him. If you are the son of God. Hand these stones into bread. If you are. Wasn't he? If you are. Wasn't he? If you are. How could you come and ask? Why? Because he came as a tempter. Today I want you to know. That there is the right hand of God, if you may permit me, and the left hand of God. For designation's sake, let's say the kindness of God is on his right. And let's say, when the wicked one is now allowed by God to carry out all his task, which God knows would end up because all things will work together for good, then that becomes his left hand. Obed, always a blessing.